we've got a paper. There's enough papers for everyone to take a paper. So this is comparable to the Anna's and it's a local one. So please take a piece of paper and you can't have that, but you can look at it. But that's, that's what you'll get when you order it. Okay. Is that. Thank you. I can't go over there. <laughs> so everyone that has a heart should be here, is that right? Because if you, are, if you have high blood pressure, if you've had a stroke, if you've had a cardiac arrest, a heart attack, um, what you'll find out here this afternoon is how you can manage this without medication. And many people take medication because no one wants to die. And so often they're told that you've got to take this or you'll have another heart attack. And it's a very scary thing. And if you haven't had a heart attack, what you'll learn here is how you can prevent having one. And it's the number one killer in the world today, is a heart disease. So what we're going to have a look at is we're going to have a look at what are the main causes of heart disease, because if you don't, if you don't address the cause, you will never have, have a cure. If you don't find out why the heart attacks are happening or the strokes are happening, of course it's going to, to be repeated and it'll, it'll keep happening. And if you want to talk about a real pandemic, this is it. Number one killer in the world today. So number one killer in the world today is heart attack or stroke. And I am sure that the powers that be in medicine are wanting to reduce that. So what have they done to reduce heart attacks? They have done a few things. Number one is they've got everyone on a fat-free diet. Is that right? Yeah? Or, or maybe low-fat. And that's why you go to a supermarket and what's one of, one of the biggest selling products? Uh, low-fat, no-fat, yeah? Has this worked? No. Has it reduced heart disease? Not no. at all. It was in 1953, a researcher named Ansel Keys, he first put forth the theory that fat causes heart disease. Saturated fat causes heart disease. And so they told everyone to stop eating butter, is that right? And start eating margarine. I'm afraid I could never eat it. <laughs> I, was, I grew up on butter. And butter tastes nice, this stuff does not. <laughs> but you know, it's amazing what people can get used to. Has that reduced heart disease, people going from butter to margarine? Not at all. No, not at all. And so, what else have they done? Oh, here's another one, salt-free diet. Has that helped? Not at all. Not at all. So it can't be the salt. And we're going to be having a look at, uh, at fats on another day, but I, th I already have talked quite a bit about the importance of oil. And my simple needs bread arrived. So I'll bring a loaf tomorrow and you can have, have a look at it. And it's a very nice bread too. So that's, of course, a bread that, that is the wheat-free. So the fat-free, or the low-fat, and with that we'll put the margarines, that hasn't worked because the saturated fats don't cause heart disease. If they did, when Captain Cook landed on the South Pacific Islands, they'd all be dying of heart attacks because, they're having, because they've traditionally always eaten coconut oil three times a day or coconut oil or coconut cream or coconut, you know, they put it in everything. It gives a lovely rich flavour to their cooking. And uh, no one was dying of heart attacks and no one was dying of strokes. So Ansel Keys, he had to eliminate every country that didn't support his theory. He had to eliminate the Maasai. They ate blood and milk and meat, zero heart disease. And if fat causes heart disease, wouldn't they be dying like flies? So you see that his, 
is not true science. And in his book, The Great Cholesterol Con, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, he says, I'm st he, he's got a quote from Ansel Keys that says, we're pretty sure the research will come. Is that science? <laughs> that's not science at all. That's, <laughs> that's supposition, supposition. And that's really where this, this theory came from. And it has not helped. Do you know what has risen? And that is uh, depression, Alzheimer's, dementia. These have increased. And I'd like to show you why. And to understand why, we're going to look at the liver. And the liver is the organ that makes cholesterol. And it'll make cholesterol according to the demands. And 80% of the cholesterol that the liver makes is made from glucose and 20% of the cholesterol that the liver makes is made from fat. So I'd like to suggest, especially when we looked at the liver and the high carbohydrate diet, that the problem is more who fat is with, which is the high carbohydrate diet which is causing one of the most dangerous fats, which is the dumping of excess glucose as fat on the internal organs, also on the inactive parts of the body. But let's have a look at the two cholesterols. One, may, one cholesterol, the two main ones, are high density lipoprotein. And high density lipoprotein is the carrier. And that's why it's often called the good guy, because it carries excess cholesterol back to the liver. LDL, low density lipoprotein, it's called the bad guy, but the body doesn't make bad things. It has a role, and its role in the body is that of a repairer and a rebuilder. So you'll always find LDL wherever there's a need for repair and rebuilding. But something else that LDL does it delivers cholesterol to the brain, and the brain loves cholesterol. You see, the brain is the fattiest organ in the body. And around the nerve cell, the, see, every cell has a membrane around it, and it's 50% fat, that membrane, but not the brain cell. It has a it has an arm coming out of it that has a fatty sheath around it, and that's the extra 30%. So around every nerve cell, the membrane is 30, is that axis, extra 30 means it's 70% fat. That's why it's the fattiest organ in the body. Something else, too, is that glucose burns at four calories per gram. Four calories per gram. <laughs> Whereas fat, fat burns at nine calories per gram. And what a lot of people don't understand is what a calorie is. A calorie is a unit of energy. And the brain consumes 15 times the fuel of any other cell. So it's a high consumer of fuel. Can you see why it loves fat? because fat will give it more than twice the units of energy that glucose will give it. So not only is the brain the fattiest organ in the body, it also likes burning fat as fuel. And that's actually how the, the ketogenic diet works. We'll look, at, we'll look at that in a little bit more detail when we look at fats. So let's have a look at how these two cholesterols work in the blood. So here's the artery. And because of its high density, you'll always find high density lipoprotein in the middle of the artery. And because of its low density, you'll always find LDL on the edge. A very interesting book by Natasha Campbell McBride. Now I mentioned her yesterday, her book, um, Gut and Psychology. Well, she's written another book called Put Your Heart in Your Mouth. And she's talking about the cause of heart disease. And the first three chapters of her book, she looks at all the things, all the environmental poisons that damage the endothelium cells that line the artery. And we are, 
We are exposed to so many today. We've been looking at it in our foods, we've been looking at it in our clothes, we've been looking at our personal care products, in our laundry detergents, they're everywhere, they're everywhere, they're everywhere. And these chemicals get into the blood and they damage the arterial wall. Also mercury, mercury is a neurotoxin. And there's three places we can be exposed to mercury. One is in the uh, silver fillings in the mouth. The other one is in fish. There's hardly a fish today, unfortunately, that doesn't have mercury. The bigger the fish, the higher the accumulation of mercury. Because mercury is bioaccumulative. That means that accumulates. So it might be in the seaweed, the fish will eat the seaweed, there will be a little bit in that, and then the bigger fish will eat the little fish. So as it goes up to the biggest fish, you've got an accumulation of mercury. We had a tuna fisherman do our program. He said, we catch 10-foot tuna. Can you imagine how much mercury is in those big fish? That's why if people love fish, I say, make it a rare treat and go for your smaller ones. Because the smaller the fish, the smaller the accumulation of mercury. So the three places we can be exposed to mercury is the mercury fillings in the mouth, fish, and also vaccines. It's in the flu vaccine. We had a lady attend our program who works in um, aged care. She said when the flu vaccine goes round, she said we always get a few deaths from the vaccine. Now that doesn't get into the newspaper, does it? Or it actually has in the last few years, but it's called death from COVID, is that right? No. And she said, some people get the flu really badly. Some people get Alzheimer's. Some people who have Alzheimer's get it worse because of the mercury in the vaccines. So they're the three places we can be exposed to mercury and that can also damage the tissues. Breathing in mold. Some people don't realize they're living in a moldy house. In fact, we get used to the smells in our house and sometimes someone else can come in the room. I know I did it one day, a lady was showing me her house and downstairs was against the wall, the earth. And she said, oh, this is my storeroom and I took one foot in and I put one foot out and I said, oh, <coughs> sorry, but I can't go in there. She couldn't smell it because she lives in the house. So mold is a, a toxic poison and it can get into the blood and it can damage the arterial walls. You know the Bible says if there's mold in the house it's got to be destroyed? That's strong words, isn't it? In my book Self Healed by Design I give the history of mold in medicine and also looking, looking at the Bible. One lady said, does that mean if my house has got mold I've got to destroy it? I said, no, not necessarily. Sometimes you just need to fix the linking tap. <laughs> Sometimes you just need to chop down a tree or two and get a bit more air into the house. You just got to look at why. Where's my resident why? Sorry that it's taken a little bit longer to get on the board today. <laughs> Why? Because there's always a reason. I was in, a, in the Qantas club waiting for my flight. And I don't usually read the newspaper, but if I've got a bit of time, I might see what the headline's in. And one caught my eye. It said, my doctor says I've got to um, get out of my house. And I thought, oh, what's that about? And it was a mouldy house. And I thought, wow, look at that. And it was apartments. And what they found out, because many people don't talk to anyone else in the apartment, that there was a big mould problem. In fact, one kitchen, the roof fell in, because above the kitchen was the bathroom. And when they investigated, the tiler who tiled the whole complex hadn't waterproofed it. Eee. <laughs> so you're always going to get mould where you've got um, damp, damp. That's why when we, we live in a rainforest, so when we, we do two programs and then one week off, two weeks program, one week off. And in the week off, on the last day of the program, the staff clean it, a new linen, everything's just right, shut every door and every window and put the fans on, big time. And that's how it stays for a week. So when we come back, the, the air the air is nice because especially in our wet season it can be raining for a few weeks. So if one lady told me that she used to get mould in her bathroom until she got a, foot, a fan and <laughs> she just keeps the fan. It's good to keep the fan on after you, you know, even 10 minutes after you've had your shower to just keep it, keep it dry because that's where mould loves to live. And it, when it gets into the blood, can damage the tissues. 
Well, students, who's going to plug up the holes? LDL. LDL, that's its role. It's the repairer and the rebuilder. And it's right here on the edge and it's plugging up the holes. Praise God it's plugging up the holes because if it didn't, we'd bleed to death, wouldn't we? We'd all bleed into our tissues. We live in an amazing body with an inbuilt ability to heal itself and the people don't realise that what they're eating and drinking and wearing, it's been a great deception, hasn't it? It's, it's damaging the arterial walls. Those arterial walls, they're lined with endothelium cells and they're quite delicate and they can't handle the chemicals, they can't handle the poisons. Something else is happening. We've got little protein molecules floating through the blood and when a person's on a high carbohydrate, high sugar diet, that high glucose in the blood connects with these protein molecules and becomes sticky and sticks on the, on the lining of the artery. And let's say we've got a particularly narrow spot here and this one here becomes dislodged, moves down and ah, stuck. If it's in the carotid artery, that's the, heart, that's the stroke. Carotid arteries come up here to the brain. If it's in the heart muscle, that's a cardiac arrest. That's the number one cause. And the sad thing is that sometimes the first sign is sudden death. There actually can be other signs and one is breathlessness. Because if you've got you know, 80%, 90% blockage of the arteries, not a lot of blood can run freely through that. And so the person gets breathless easy. That can be one sign. I have a friend, his name's Dr. David Harris. He's a craniosacral chiropractor, very fit. He's in his 60s and every year he goes to Europe for a couple of weeks cycling, 200 kilometer cycles. He's a vegetarian, he's a Seventh-day Adventist, doesn't drink or smoke and he was getting breathless. And a friend of him who's a cardiologist said, I want to do an angiogram on you. And they found that some, one artery 90% blockage, another artery 85% blockage. So they rushed him into hospital and gave him a bypass. And not long after the operation, he came to our retreat because he'd been put on cholesterol lowering medication, yeah? So let's have a look at what he's put on. He's put on uh, aspirin to thin the blood, yeah? And he's put on, we'll, we'll, we'll call it the statin drugs. Lipitor, Crestor, they're all statin drugs. They're cholesterol lowering medication. And he did not want to be on that, but he didn't want to die either. And so I said, David, there must be a cause. So I put my detective hat on because those arteries don't just block up for no reason. And how many people who are drinking, smoking, high meat diet say, huh, what's the use of being a vegetarian? Look at him. Yeah. Have you found that? Mm -hmm. So I said, David, there must be a cause. I said, tell me about your childhood. Was it a happy, healthy childhood? He said, no, it was not. My father was an alcoholic and both my parents smoked. Aha! Aha. Do you know in Australia you get fined if you smoke in a car and there are children in the car? I don't know if that happens here. But you're not allowed to smoke in, in any facility today. You have, to, you have to come outside to smoke. And you know why? Because when children are smoke, uh, breathing in that passive smoke, that passive smoke can sometimes be even more dangerous. So what's happening in young David's arteries? That's not mine, is it? No. Let's look at young David's arteries. There are 4,000, between four and 6,000 chemicals in cigarettes. So he's, smoke, he's breathing in this passive smoke. And what's happening to young David's arteries as a young child? He's getting damage. And so as a young child, even probably I'd like to suggest by the age of 15, he's already got some build up there. And that damage to the arterial wall, it heals 
but I'm sure we've all had cuts and scrapes in our life. What's the scar tissue like compared to other tissue? It becomes harder and more rigid, doesn't it? And he told me that in 2010, he wanted to put on more muscle, so he started to eat tuna. He was eating large amounts of tuna, and then he got mercury poisoning. But what was happening in his arteries with the, with the mercury from the tuna? Can you see what's happening? So very clearly, I quickly saw there are two main culprits here in David's life, and that was the breathing in the cigarette smoke probably for the first 16 years of his life. Every day he's breathing in that passive smoke. And of course in the winter time all the doors are shut and there's not a fresh air and it's, it's even worse. And I said, aha, we've found the cause. And I said to David, I can't tell you what to do with your medication. I have no authority over your medication. Only you and your doctor have. Did you hear that? Because you are the master of your destiny and it's your choice. And the doctor may say, you've got to take this. What do you say? Thank you for your advice. Or you can say what my husband would say, I don't believe that. <laughs> uh, no, thank you. <laughs> so you, you are the one that makes the choice and you make the choice according to information. And when David heard this lecture, he made a decision and he stopped the aspirin and he stopped the statins. There's a book in our library at home, it's called Lipitor, Thief of Memory. Now Lipitor is a very common cholesterol lowering medication and it's written by uh, a guy who's a doctor and an astronaut, Dr. Dwayne Graveline is the author's name. And he was, I think it was early 50s, he went to have his yearly um, yearly blood test, yearly you know, physical, because astronauts have to do that every year. And the doctor said, mm, your cholesterol levels are a bit high. What were his cholesterol levels? 220. He said, I want you to go on cholesterol lowering medication. He said, you're too young to have a heart attack. So he went on it through what? Fear. He doesn't want to have a heart attack. Six weeks later, his wife found him out in the garden. He didn't know who she was. He didn't know who he was. He didn't know where he was. I mean, he married his childhood sweetheart. <laughs> They've been together for <laughs> probably nearly 40 years. So they stopped the medication and his mind became clear. They started, you know, it started to improve within a couple of days. One, about 10 months later, he went back for his yearly, his yearly health tests reports. They did a blood test. The doctor said, mm, 220, it's too high. I want you to go on this lip. I want you to go back on the Lipitor. He said, no way, mate. He said, I nearly went mad on that. Doctor said, this is very rare. Did you hear that? Rare. And so, and why does the doctor say that? Because that's what the pharmaceutical companies tell him. I, I think most doctors are ethical, but the pharmaceutical company is not an ethical company. So he, um, he went back on it, but half dose. He said, all right, I'll do half dose. Six weeks later, his wife found him out in the garden. He didn't know who she was, where we was, where he was, who he was. So of course they stopped it immediately. And then he put his story up on a social media site. And they got onto it and said, wow, what a story. Can we put this out there? And he said, be my guest. Within hours, thousands of hits, the same thing happened to me. Yeah. See, when people don't talk, they don't know, do they? That's why he wrote the book, Lipitor, Thief of Memory. Here are the side effects of cholesterol-lowering medication. Alzheimer's, dementia, memory loss, muscle wasting, and they've just added another one, breast cancer, because you saw this morning, our sex hormones are made from cholesterol. So I had the great advantage of 10 years ago, running a retreat in Alabama, and we had a nutritionist attend the program. She's 69. She said, I still work as a nutritionist. I have my own private practice. I work in a hospital with a doctor. She said, I have the advantage of being schooled in university 40 years ago. 
She said 40 years ago it was perfectly fine to have a cholesterol level of 300. Mm -hmm. 300 was perfectly fine. And what are we told today if it's 220? You're going to have a heart attack. Just remember what my husband says, I believe that. I don't believe that. Mm. So what have they done? Number five, they've lowered the levels. They've lowered the yardstick, yeah? If the cholesterol levels go under 150, that person is a recipe for Alzheimer's disaster because our brain needs the fat. We had a, a midwife attend our program. She was in her 80s. She said, for 20 years I worked in Africa. And she said, at one point, the African babies were not developing properly. Uh, their yard stones mentally were not happening. And so they investigated and they discovered that the mothers were watering down the powdered milk. So those developing brains were not getting enough fat. And because the developing brains weren't getting enough fat, the, the children mentally were not developing properly. Let's take that to the other end of life, where we're seeing Alzheimer's, dementia. Isn't this fat-free diet? Now, if someone's on cholesterol-lowering medication and a fat-free diet and a, and a mouthful of mercury <laughs> and they're on the statin drugs, that's a recipe for Alzheimer's. And how many people in aged care facilities are on cholesterol-lowering medications? I was in New Zealand a few years ago and I gave the lecture on the heart. I spoke of the dangers of cholesterol-lowering medication and that was, I think, Monday night. Wednesday night, a couple came to me and they were in their late, mid-late 80s. And the man said to me, we've got a story for you. He said, my wife here, we're about to put her in an aged care facility. She leaves the iron on. We find her late at night walking the streets. He said, oh, it was getting very difficult to, to look after her. And we did not want to but we thought for her safety we have to put her there. And then we heard your lecture and she's been on Lipitor for 10 years. He said, we stopped immediately and then tears came in his eyes. He said, we've got my wife back. 48 hours. He said, her mind is becoming clear. Yeah. How many are in aged care facilities in that situation? Eek. We've all been deceived. Have you, have you noticed that every day? <laughs> but I'm so glad that there is the great God of heaven who keeps truth for heaven and there is truth out there. That's why I love that Psalm 146. Put not your trust in princes. Who are the princes? The authorities. Now there are some good doctors, there are some truths out there. How do we decipher what is truth? Do you know we've got history? And the history reveals that there was hardly any heart disease until the 1920s and they started changing those fats. And Crisco. And the ads around Crisco were huge. So guess what everyone did? They started to buy those altered fats, those dangerous fats. You see, polyunsaturated fats deteriorate very quickly, so the best way to eat them is in the nuts and in the seeds. But when they're extracted using heat and chemicals put into clear plastic bottles, well, it doesn't matter that they're in clear plastic bottles because they're already totally destroyed in the extraction process. So those altered fats become carcinogenic. And those altered fats get into the blood and they're, and they're contributing to the damage on the walls of the arteries. To say that cholesterol causes heart disease is like saying the fire trucks are causing the fires. Well, have you noticed they're always there? They're the one common denominator. Mm-hmm. 
Cholesterol does not cause heart disease. Cholesterol is just doing its job. It's doing what God designed it to do, which is repair the damage in the arteries. The cause of heart disease is all those environmental poisons that we are exposed to. And there's one environmental poison that I did not mention, and that is drug therapy. Drugs are chemicals. <laughs> yes, in a crisis they can save a life. It's like the man that said to me he was on a panic attack medication. I said, why are you on panic attack meditation? medication? He said, well, I had 100 houses half built and they bought GST and then it just sunk me. He said, I was in immediate financial crisis and he said, and I started to shake, I started to panic, so they put me on cholesterol, I mean, panic attack medication. I said, okay, it's uh, five years later now, uh, how's finances now? He said, really good. He said, it all settled down, you know, I got a financial advisor, we're able to sell off a few things, it's all right now. So why is he still on the panic attack medication? Mm -hmm. Sometimes for a crisis, medication is put on, but when the crisis eases, you can stop it. But you know what often happens? The person becomes addicted. And then it's really hard to come off. But just as our body gets used to things little by little by little, so it can get used to not having it little by little by little by little. So has all of this reduced heart disease? Not at all, not at all. And the Framingham Heart Study, this is a little town of Framingham, maybe 40,000 people, been going for probably over 40 years now. People die, more people come on. And they set it up to prove that cholesterol causes heart disease. And I like this study because the pharmaceutical company doesn't fund the study. The meat industry, the dairy industry, the wheat industry, the sugar industry, no, they're not funding this. It's an independent study. But it's 40 years now and they still have not proved that cholesterol causes heart disease. There are some people with low cholesterol levels that are having heart attacks. But you know what it did show? it showed that people with high cholesterol levels don't get Alzheimer's. Do you need to um, digest that for a minute? Isn't that incredible? Most people go on cholesterol-lowering medication out of fear because they don't want to have a heart attack. But as you can see, the best thing you can do for your arteries is start to eliminate exposure to the environmental poisons. That's, that's, that's one of the best starts. So I met, met a lady, it was a few years ago now, she's passed now, her name was Dr. Agatha Thrash. And her husband, Dr. Calvin Thrash, these two doctors started Yuchi Pines Health Retreat. Yuchi Pines Health Retreats, I think, is in Georgia. And we visited their health retreat probably 16 years ago now. And she tells this amazing story. They had a lady come to their retreat who had 85% blockage of her main arteries. She'd had an angiogram that showed that. But she came to the retreat. She was an alcoholic. She was in her 70s. She stopped alcohol. She went through the program and had a complete turnaround in her health, in her life. In fact, she was so excited about what she was learning, she surrendered her life to God and became a Christian. And at the end of the program, she said to Agatha, do I have to leave? <laughs> and Agatha said, we'll find a spot for you. So she found a little spot where she could stay and she helped with the laundry, she helped in a few areas. In fact, she said that that was the happiest 10 months of her life. She regained her health. But sadly, she had an embolism go in her brain and had a massive stroke and she died. Now, Agatha Thrash did a post-mortem on her and she said her arteries were clear. So it's not often that you can test it, but this is a fascinating story. They were 85% blocked. Ten months later, they were totally clear. We had a guy attend our program. He was Samoan, big guy. 
he was in his 60s and he'd had the angiogram and he had 85% occlusion of two main arteries and he said I don't want to do what they want to do and he said and I've, I've come to you for help. Now the first, this was our retreat when we were away out, Michael used to market it as Australia's wildest health retreat. We used to have to get a helicopter service to get people in that didn't want to go up the mountains and through the creeks. We didn't have electricity, we had solar. And when he arrived, because our retreat was on the side of the hill, so wherever you walked you either went downhill or uphill, and if you did go downhill, guess what, you have to go back up. And he could only go two steps, and he just gets so breathless. See, that was a certain, you know, it's not the only sign of the blockage, but it was a clear sign with him. And if he pushed it too hard, he'd, he'd get that pain in his chest. He was with us for two weeks. By the end of the two weeks, he could go up and downhill with no breathlessness. So I'd like to suggest he was already clearing out big time. So how do we clear those arteries out? We give them the right conditions. We give them the sustain me principles. The sustain me principles are the basic things that will strengthen that arteries. So let's just recap them and have a look at how they work on the heart. Sunshine, our DNA has 2,500 receptor sites for vitamin D. You cannot heal without vitamin D. You cannot access your minerals without vitamin D. Vitamin D is essential. Let's have a look at the cell. Here's the cell. And our calcium, which is an important mineral, but it's not, it's not a good one by itself. It needs all the other minerals. And it's called the king because when it gets into the cell, all the other minerals piggyback on the back of calcium, but it can't get into the cell without vitamin D. When vitamin D is present, then the calcium can come into the cell. So sunshine's important, as is water. I used to do a live blood analysis when I was the health director at Misty Mountain Health Retreat. And blood, Basically, when the person's dehydrated, it looks like this. Blood should look like this. And whenever I'd see blood that looked like that, I always presumed I've spoiled the slide. It's very easy to spoil a slide. So I would, and I remember with, it was just a young girl, she was 18, five blood slides later, her blood still looks like this. And I said, have you had any water to drink today? <coughs> She was 18. It was three o'clock in the afternoon. She said, I don't drink water. This girl did not want to be at our health retreat. She was, mother made her come. I said, well, I can't look at your blood. It is so clumped, <laughs> so clumped. I cannot look at your blood. I cannot assess it, she said. And then her mother walked in the room and we took her blood. You just, just need a pinprick and put it on the slide, put it on the... Uh, uh, under the microscope and it comes up on the, on the TV screen and her mother's blood looked like this. I said, look at your mother's blood. She's, she's 25 years older than you and she's got better blood than you, <laughs> she said. Do you know the next day at the first lecture, she's sitting there with her arms folded, <clears throat> looking around and she started to listen and it made sense and she sat up and I'm lecturing and I'm watching her. She got a pen. She got paper, she started to write. <laughs> and that's what she was like for the rest of the time. She became interested. The next blood slide I looked at, it was like this. And that's how I know that one of the best blood thinners you can take is water. Water. That's what our blood mostly is made of, is water. Now that's a cheap blood thinner, isn't it? Do you know what they're finding out now about aspirin? It causes stomach bleeds. It's the number one cause of stomach ulcers. It causes eye bleeds. There's your contributing to deteriorating eyesight. And it causes brain bleeds. E. There's a contributing, fact, contributing factor to Alzheimer's. No wonder we've, well in Australia, we've got 1,700 cases of Alzheimer's being diagnosed every week. 
I don't know about you, but I don't want to be there. And if you live the way they lived, you'll be there. Mm. So water is vital. Sleep. I think it's tomorrow night we look at sleep. We look at how while we sleep, our body revives and recharges. And if our body's not reviving and recharging, it puts a strain on the heart. Trust in God. Stress. We had a 46-year-old lady from the UK attend our program. She just had a stroke. She had an angiogram and her arteries were clear. How'd that happen? So I put my detective hat on. I wanted to know why. And the day she had the stroke, she'd had a late night. She'd hardly had any sleep. She got into the office early. She's drinking coffee to try and wake herself up. And then on top of all that, she got bad news that the, the company had just gone into bankruptcy. So, oh, this, uh, and her body just went, enough. <laughs> her arteries contracted and basically she had a stroke. And yet her arteries were clear. So stress is a big factor. It's a huge factor. And there's a wonderful recipe for stress. It's called love the moment. I'm just loving this moment. This is a beautiful area, isn't it? Just a beautiful area. I'm loving my new friends I'm meeting. I never cease to get excited about this incredible information on how the body can heal. Can you see what I'm doing? You just love the moment. I had a very nice lunch. I had lentils. Collard greens, we don't have collard greens. Baked beetroot and baked uh, Brussels sprouts. Can you see how you love the moment? Love the moment because you'll never have another one. Love the moment and if the moment is really bad, you know what you think? This is going to get better in a minute. <laughs> I certainly discovered that with so many children. You know what would happen sometimes? Sometimes the baby's <coughs> crying because the baby wants a feed and the two-year-old's just just scraped his toe and the four-year-old, I don't know, the, the dress wouldn't go on the doll and, the, and then the, the next one can't get the centre structure and then the next one is having trouble with maths. Have you noticed, mothers, everything happens at once? <laughs> but you know what I learned? That it's going to be better in a minute and it does. <laughs> you feed the baby, you stop school, <laughs> you get the the son who was struggling with the long division to get a band-aid and put it on the two-year-old's foot because, you know, band-aids fix everything. So, it, it, you know, th things change moment by moment, isn't it? Isn't it a, there's a song, isn't there, what a difference a day makes? And it's all what you compare it to, isn't that true? People say to me, don't you miss home? Well, I don't allow myself to miss home. Of course I love home, but oh, this is pretty nice. I said to John, I'm enjoying where I'm staying because it reminds me of home. <laughs> yes, I was in the city of Atlanta a few weeks ago, but I found a little tree and I found a park. <laughs> There's always something you can be thankful for. Isn't that true? Always something you can be thankful for. Abstain. We had a pathologists do our program, he said, we did studies on caffeine and we found that you need five glasses of water to account for the dehydrating agents in one cup of coffee. Whoa. Now, when you have a look at those figures, most people in America are dehydrated, is that right? And in dehydration, the blood gets a little thicker. It doesn't make any sense to cut your hand, put a Band-Aid on, cut your hand, put a Band-Aid on, cut your hand, put a Band-Aid on, take a cup of coffee while you take your aspirin, yeah. <laughs> which is supposed to be a blood thinner. I had one guy at one meeting, he came up and he said, my nose, the, blood, the blood's just running out. And he said, and I just scraped my hand and it's just, I'm bruised all over from the blood thinners that he's on. <laughs> Well, I've got some good news. There's an alternative. It's called cayenne pepper. Yeah. 
There's no need for the rat poison, I mean the wolfrin. And you know that's what wolfrin is, it's rat poison. So we'll just say lower the levels. So blood thinners, let's have a look at blood thinners, which will allow the, the, the aspirin to stop. Cane pepper. Cane pepper is a very safe herb. There's a book called Back to Eden by Jethro Kloss. And it was written in the early 1900s. It's called The Bible on Herbs. And he devotes half a page to every herb. Ten pages he devotes to cane pepper. And he quotes two doctors who use it in their practice. And they say that it has never caused a lesion and it's impossible to abuse it. In other words, you could have a bucket of it a day and it will still not hurt you, but I don't know anyone who <coughs> takes a bucket a day. So how much would you take? Well, if you're stopping blood thinning medication, you could take a capsule three times a day. It'll boost your digestion. Remember we looked at yesterday how the cane pepper boosts digestion. The other blood thinner, is water. How much water do we need in a day? Ideally, about eight glasses. That's eight eight ounce glasses. And when you take that water, you take a crystal of Celtic salt. How much Celtic salt? About the size of a sesame seed. I'm reading a book at the moment, it's called Sea Salt's Hidden Power and it's by a, a Dr. Jacques de Langry. Do you know that there's over 4 million acres of peninsula where they have the, the salt flats? That's a lot of land, isn't it? In France, this is a hand harvested sea salt. And if he gets someone that's had a stroke or a heart attack, he puts them on, or high blood pressure, he puts them on Celtic salt. Because he said what it does is it balances out. So let me show you one of the things that can cause the pressure to build up in the cell. So we have a bilayed membrane around every cell and there are sodium potassium pumps and these sodium potassium pumps are constantly going like that balancing the potassium and the sodium and the highest concentration of mineral inside the cell is potassium and the highest concentration outside the cell is sodium there is a little sodium inside the cell but the highest concentration inside the cell is potassium so when someone's having table salt and table salt has two minerals and this is one of the problems. I think we'll rub this one out. So I've got a bit more room. So the highest concentration of sodium is found in seawater. And seawater contains 92 minerals. We're just gonna rub this horrible word out. It contains 92 minerals. And of those 92 minerals, 30% is sodium and 50% is chloride. And because these are the first crystals formed, that's scooped up, it's bleached white, aluminium is put with it, there's your table salt. And some marketers even have the hide to call it sea salt. Well, it came from the sea. Do you see that? So table salt has two minerals. And these minerals are such harsh minerals that they can kill the taste buds. Have you noticed when someone's putting table salt on everything, they don't even taste to see if it needs it? And they're just putting salt on everything? Well, it's because their taste buds are dying because it's such a harsh salt. If you to inject that straight into the veins of a person, you would kill them. And you mix, you mix table salt with, say, four teaspoons to a quart is the concentration in seawater. So you put a tank full of that mixture and then put 
put fish from the sea into that tank, they all die. This is actually a deadly poison, <laughs> this salt. It'll kill a person, it kills the fish. What our, what our body needs is the balance. But you see, what's happening with many people, they're having table salt on everything, and so the sodium levels are rising. And potassium, that's found in all your fresh fruit and vegetables. And some people don't eat any fresh fruit and vegetables, especially on that high carbohydrate diet. So potassium levels are dropping. And because potassium levels are dropping, the sodium potassium pumps, they, they actually can't do it. So the highest concentration merges into the lowest and sodium levels rise. And when sodium levels rise, the cell swells. That's called high blood pressure. So the doctor's right, the table salt will contribute to high blood pressure. But unfortunately, people are told to stop all salt. So the best salt is the Celtic. Because the Celtic salt contains 82 minerals. Where are the other 10? Well, they're in such pico proportion, they're barely measurable. And the Celtic salt contains three magnesiums. It contains magnesium chloride, it contains magnesium bromide, and it contains magnesium sulfate. Magnesium is a water-hungry molecule, and that, that explains why, I don't know whether you've gone over and looked at that Celtic salt, it's very wet. <laughs> and it's wet because it has three magnesiums in it. And magnesium is a water-hungry molecule, so if it's raining a lot, your Celtic salt is going to get even wetter. It's the three magnesiums. And magnesium is the ultimate muscle relaxant. And when a person has high blood pressure, they always assess the diastolic. Your highest reading is the, the systolic, and the lowest is your diastolic. So the bottom reading is your heart at rest. So ideally, you should be probably about 120 over 70. That's probably what most doctors want the blood pressure to be. But if the, if the diastolic, that bottom one, gets up over 90, that's an indicator, that's, you've, you call it, you've got high blood pressure. And they particularly look at that bottom level because it's the heart at rest. So if it's high when the heart's at rest, that's a problem. Well, magnesium relaxes the heart at rest. So this salt, rather than cause high blood pressure, it can relieve high blood pressure because it now puts a proper balance of minerals in and out of the cell. And the three magnesiums relax the heart at rest. And I mentioned this in another lecture. When you put that Celtic salt on your tongue, then the magnesiums are absorbed through your mucous membranes, goes to the cell membrane, and then you have the water, and the magnesium pulls the water inside the cell. It's the quickest way to hydrate a body. So the things that we need to abstain from are table salt. If you can't get Celtic salt, Himalayan salt is probably the next best thing. And I just read a text that I got from a friend who lives in North Carolina. She went to the health food shop to buy Celtic salt. And the lady in the health food shop said, sorry, it's all run out because of Barbara O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the health food shop lady said. But I'm sure they'll come up because I was amazed. Four and a half million acres they've got of these salt flats. So it, it'll be available again. So abstain from table salt, abstain from caffeine. Caffeine causes a crisis response in the body. And whenever there's a crisis response, the blood pressure rises so that you can do the run or the fight or the climb of your life. But the problem is, you don't have to do the run or the climb or the fight of your life because all you're doing is sitting at the breakfast table drinking a cup of coffee. <laughs> but still the blood pressure rises. 
when someone has a cup of coffee. Yeah? What's your thought on kosher salt? Which is? Kosher salt? I'm not familiar with kosher salt. If you've got salt, and I know there's another one called real salt, what you would do is you would find a mineral analysis of that salt, find out how many minerals there are in and you and you can contact the company and say, could you please give me a mineral analysis of your salt? So while it's hard to get the Celtic salt, you can certainly, there it is there, it's heavy too. <laughs> Why is it heavy? Because it's wet. <laughs> I had a standing order on Amazon. Yeah. yeah. And they canceled my subscription because they couldn't get it. Oh, true. Yeah. Well, my daughter says she gets 50 pounds at a time from the salt company, I think she said. She lives in Wisconsin. If I've been taking this salt and I didn't know it was supposed to be one crystal, I took like many more than that. Well, the fact is I take many more. Okay. But if someone's used to no salt and the body has adapted to no salt, not very well, <laughs> but they need to ease themselves back into the salt. Okay, so it's okay if I if we do it a page. Yeah, I do. Okay. I have quite a bit. Also tobacco, tobacco must stop. Tobacco is a big contributing factor to the damage in the arterial walls. All your chemicals, you've got to get the chemicals out of your homes. And so if you go to the average nutritionist, and I know there are nutritionists and there are nutritionists, just as there are doctors and there are doctors. Some nutritionists will tell you, you've got to, they won't tell you to stop the chemicals, they won't tell you to stop the tobacco, they won't tell you to stop the coffee as they're drinking their own cup of coffee, but they will tell you to stop salt. And you might say, but I'm taking the Celtic salt. And they will say to you, it's no different, it's still got sodium. Well, it's very different. It's so different that it will kill the fish when you put it in that salt water, indicating that there is a big difference. But unfortunately, many nutrition courses today, I'm not saying all, but a lot of them, if you go to the back of the textbooks and look who funded the studies, uh, the meat industry, the dairy industry, the great, so what are they gonna tell you? No. I've rubbed those out because I'm making a new list because that goes too low and I don't think you can see it. And the other is wheat. The hybridised wheat of today has a changed structure. And this changed structure is very, very difficult to break down. And caffeine and the hybridised wheat are two well-known contributors to heart arrhythmia or tachycardia. So those foods must stop. So looking at our sustain me list, inhale. What's important when looking at maintaining our blood network is that the blood vessels are open and running freely. And there are some things that can open blood vessels. They're called vasodilators. Dilator mean opening, vaso indicating the blood capillary networks. And there are some herbs that are vasodilators. So let me take a, uh, make a list of the vasodilators because vasodilators means more blood is running through the system. So vasodilators. And vasodilators, they can work with the blood thinners to make sure you've got a nice <coughs> opening of blood flow through the body. So cayenne pepper is a vasodilator. Garlic is a vasodilator. Ginger is a vasodilator. And that brings us to inhale. When we inhale through the nose, the nose purifies the air, humidifies the air, warms the air, balances blood gases, and also pressurizes the air. And there are two 
blood gases that have a vasodilator effect. And one is carbon dioxide, CO2. Carbon dioxide has a vasodilator effect. So breathing in and out through the nose maintains the, the correct carbon dioxide levels in the blood. You can have too much carbon dioxide, you can have not enough carbon dioxide. When you breathe through your mouth, you lose too much carbon dioxide. When you breathe in and out through your nose, that maintains carbon dioxide levels. And I mentioned this earlier, four molecules of carbon dioxide on the haemoglobin, because there are four docking sites for oxygen, but for that haemoglobin to pick up oxygen, there needs to be a transfer of four molecules of carbon dioxide. Four molecules of carbon dioxide means four molecules of oxygen can be picked up. So there's a few reasons why nose breathing in and out is so important. And carbon dioxide is a vasodilator. When we breathe through our nose, it stimulates the release of nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is a vasodilator. When we breathe through our mouth, no nitric oxide. It's only released when we breathe in and out through our nose. And nitric oxide, not only is it a vasodilator, it also has antibacterial properties. What an amazing body we live in. Everything we need is in this body. We just need to know how to access it. So I was called to a lady, I was in Wales last year at a conference, and they said, Barbara, quickly, the lady's having a panic attack. So I went up to her, and she was <laughs> like this. So what's the first thing you do? Close the mouth, close the mouth, close the mouth, close the mouth. And I touched her arms. Don't you hate the way COVID stopped us touching each other? I squeezed her shoulders. And I spoke firmly but calmly. I said, breathe deeply, long, slow, deep, long, slow, deep. I got her to breathe in and out through her nose. Do you know what that does? That opens those blood capillary networks. But long, slow, deep stimulates your parasympathetic nervous system. That's your calming nervous system. I said, just breathe deeply, breathe deeply. What had happened was, where this conference was in Wales, it was very beautiful there, and there were little cabins, and she'd gone into one of the cabins and she could smell mold. And she said, and she, she's had some experience with mold. <laughs> and she started to stress, and when she went back to the office, she sat down and got really panicky because she wanted to be at the conference, but she didn't want to stay in that mold, you know, all these things and, they said, Barbara, quick, she's having a panic attack. And I said, I'm going to put a little bit of salt in your mouth and some water, have a bit of water. And she nodded. And you see what we're also doing? Diverting her, diverting her, diverting. Breathe deeply, squeezing her shoulders, squeezing her shoulders, touch, squeezing her shoulders. And I had some doTERRA peppermint beadlets. You're familiar with the doTERRA essential oils? And those peppermint beadlets, when they burst in your mouth, oh, I said, can I put a peppermint beadlet on your tongue? See, I get permission. She nodded. I would say within three minutes, she totally calmed down. And what did I use? I used breath. I used salt. I used water. And I used that peppermint essential oil. Her friends were there and they said, we've never seen that. We have never seen that. They said, what we usually have to do is somehow get her in the car, take her to emergency. And you know what the nurses in emergency do? They quickly assess the real crisis. And to them, a panic attack is not a real crisis. A heart attack is a crisis. A knee hanging off is a crisis. <laughs> uh, you, you know. But a panic attack to them is not a real crisis. It's not a, it's not 
It's not risking their life. So they're looking at life risking, you know, and sometimes you're going to into casualty, or we call it casualty emergency, and it's a quiet night, and the person will be seen fairly quickly, but I tell you some, one lady said eight hours, she sat there for eight hours. Because you don't know you're gonna be there for eight hours, they think that very soon. And you know, the nurses are about to see you, and ah, oh, the ambulance comes in, and there's been a car accident, and we've got someone, you know, that, 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 that's, that's how it happens. So how nice if you can just handle it yourself. Just handle it yourself. Just using everything that the body has. So inhaling and exhaling through the nose can actually help to pull someone out of a heart attack. We had a lady one day have a heart attack at our retreat. It was in a cooking class. And they rang me, they said, Barbara, ladies had a heart attack. I ran down, it's important to keep fit, <laughs> ran down. Lady was lying on the ground, about 15 people there, all <laughs> standing back. There was a guy holding a pulse and he said, the pulse is hardly there. Her face was white, she was about 80, and her, her husband said she's already had two of these this year. So I said to my, my offsider, quick, cane pepper, pulled the cane pepper, I don't know how much I got, just got a teaspoon, maybe half a teaspoon, put it in her mouth, gave her a bit of water, she was half conscious. Within two minutes, the guy holding the pulse said, the pulse is strong. The lady sat up and said, what happened? And her husband, you see, the last two times he'd called the ambulance, you know, there was this big crisis, they got into... And he couldn't believe it. <laughs> he couldn't believe how the cane pepper had just, had just pulled her out. What did the cane pepper do? Cane pepper does three things. Number one, it thins the blood. Number two, it has a vasodilator effect. It opens those capillaries. So you get a strong flow of blood going through. And that's what the cane pepper did. Cane pepper does a third thing and that strengthens the arterial walls. It's a remarkable herb. And there's a book called Curing with Cayenne by Sam Beiser, and Sam Beiser is a medical journalist. And in that book he says, you put cayenne pepper with any other herb, it'll intensify its action. That's what a powerful herb it is. So cayenne pepper. And if there's bleeding anywhere in the body, it'll seal the capillaries. Now that seems like a contra contradiction, doesn't it? Well, remember herbs, Psalm 104 verse 14, God gave herbs for the service of man. So what, that, what it does, it works with your body. If there's bleeding there, it'll seal it, like the lady that was bleeding heavily. Sometimes ladies who have a hormonal imbalance, before they, their periods stop, they will have heavy, heavy bleeding and two capsules of cayenne pepper three times a day will seal that bleeding. Powerful herb. It's almost a first aid kit in one, isn't it? Just the cayenne pepper. So inhaling and exhaling through the nose has a powerful effect on blood work, on opening those blood vessels. Nutrition. What's very important with nutrition is minerals, and minerals are found in your dark green leafy vegetables. Minerals are found in the Celtic salt. We should be eating high fiber. There's all your vegetables and fruits. Uh, protein, generous proteins. There's your beans, your nuts, your seeds, and healthy fats. And what are people told? if they have heart disease. Stop the salt and stop the fat, is that right? But as I've just shown you, fat's not the problem. The altered fats are the problem. That's your deep fried foods. That's also uh, the, those polyunsaturated oils that are in plastic bottles in the supermarket, keep away from them.
moderation. Don't overdo it. Don't overdo work. Don't overdo anything. All things should be done in moderation. Exercise. The heart is a muscle and strength comes by exercise. And the heart muscle is no exception. And what exercise does, it opens the capillaries, especially if you're breathing in and out through the nose, which is, which is challenging when you're exercising. I don't know if anyone tried it this morning. <laughs> it's not easy. But you can train yourself into it. You think you're not getting enough air. But where do we need that oxygen? In here. And the oxygen can't get in unless it's got the transfer of carbon dioxide. And when you breathe out through your mouth, you lose too much carbon dioxide. Yes? No, it's only cane pepper that has those properties. Now, cane pepper comes from the capsicum family or the bell pepper family. Cane comes from the chili. And the black pepper is an irritant. Now, people are told, say they're having turmeric, which is a powerful anti-inflammatory herb, that you have to have black pepper with the turmeric. You've heard that? It intensifies its action. So I was intrigued to find out why. And I found out that the plant chemical in black pepper is pepperine. And pepperine is what intensifies the action of turmeric. And cayenne pepper contains pepperine. So instead of putting black pepper with turmeric, you can put cayenne pepper with turmeric. So that's good to know. So I want to show you what happens with exercise and heart disease. The exercise that is the most efficient, most effective and most powerful to strengthen the heart is the high intensity interval training. So as the name implies, the high intensity interval training are intervals of high intensity, intervals of recovery, and this is done for a cycle. I read a book called Body by Science by Dr. Doug McGuff and he's a cardiovascular doctor and I also read another book by uh, Dr. Al Sears, he's also called an exercise doctor and another book that I read was by Dr. Michael Mosley and his book's called Fast Exercise and I always get something out of a book, even if it's a book by different authors on the same subject. I love reading several of them and then, then, then you see a balance, you see common ground there. And they came to the conclusion that 30 seconds high intensity is the most effective. And you might think that 30 seconds isn't very long, try it. It's a long time when you're running for your life. <laughs> and if you can't run. Most of the research has been done on exercise bike. The beauty of the exercise bike is you're holding on for people who are a bit unsteady on their feet or ha who have hip, knee or ankle problems, then the exercise bike is great. And you can go as hard and as fast as you can. And recovery time can average a minute and a half, about 90 seconds. What's recovery time? Cycling very slowly. <laughs> Giving you time to get your breath back. Again, in and out through the nose. Michael and I, at home, we run up hills and walk down the other side. And then we run up the next hill and walk down the other side. So walking down is our recovery. What they have shown is that if you're slowly active in recovery time, it's more effective than if you just totally stop in recovery time. So last week I was in South Dakota and I was at a health retreat there called Black Hills. And they have 
It's an incredible little valley and it's got these red cliffs either side. And there's a walk called Inspiration Point. <laughs> and whoa, it's quite a climb. It's quite a climb up to the top. So there's no need to run when you're climbing up there. And what we found that after 30 seconds, you can stop and look at the view. <laughs> Looking at the view doesn't mean you can't go any further, it means it's time for your recovery time. Looking at the view is recovery time. And that's usually done for a cycle of six. Now have you done the maths on that? That's 15 minutes a day, that's nothing. If you don't think that you have 15 minutes to exercise, it's time to assess what you do with your time. And the first thing to assess is how long are you on the computer? How long are you on your phone? How long are you on any type of technology? And I think you'll find it'll come to more than 15 minutes for most people. This is the best insurance policy that you can make. In fact, the rewards from this far exceed the, uh, what you put into it. I always count the 30 seconds. It's not one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No, no, that's not that count. One and two and three. If I don't count, I don't do 30. Because by the time I'm up to 20, my body's starting to say, that'll do. When I get to 25, my body says, this is ridiculous. When I get to 30, oh, I'm really pushing myself. So you just got to work out what works for you. You can do it on the rebounder if you leap or if you jog on the rebounder, you can certainly get high intensity. Push-ups, push-ups can do it. 30 push-ups will, will give you the high intensity. Swimming can do it. You just gotta work out what, what you can do. Recovery time is your, is your indicator of fitness. So the longer you take to recover, the more of an indication is your unfitness. But the good news is that the more you do it, the stronger you get. So in his book, Pace, Dr. Al Sears, the P means progressive. What you can't do now, you will be able to do if you keep going. And Al Sears gives the story of a lady that did seven seconds high intensity and she needed 15 minutes to recover. Not many people are that unfit. <laughs> but I tell you that story so that if you're better than that, you're doing well. <laughs> it's progressive. The next day, she might be able to do eight seconds and only take 10 minutes to recover. So the more you do it, the stronger it gets. It appears that also the value of this high intensity is it gives the body a shock. And I have another book in my library, it's called The Gabriel Diet by John Gabriel. And this guy, I have to give it to you in um, kilos. He was 183 kilos. I'm about 48 kilos, so that gives you an idea. He was an 183 kilos. That, that, that's probably nearly 400 pounds, yeah? Yep, or 380 pounds, something. That's pretty big. So he was huge, just like this. And he lost, he was 183 kilos. He's now 100 kilos. So he lost 80, 83 kilos. That's a lot. That's almost a whole me that he, that he lost. And well, it's actually almost two me that he lost. And there's a photo of him in the book of him really huge, and then a few months later, down a little bit, uh, probably down a quarter. And then there's another photo of him down a half, and you, you think, you know, he looks pretty good, he's in his 40s. And then there's another photo of him, and his body looks like a 20-year-old body. It's tight, it's firm. And you can count the abs on his stomach. Wow! That's quite an incredible story. And he did the high intensity interval training, though he didn't explain it like that. He said that he'd be walking along and he'd quickly jump down 
and he'd do 30 push-ups. He said he kept tricking his body into thinking that a tiger was about to jump out of the bushes and chase him. <laughs> that was, that was his, his theory. And of course, he's referring to Stone Age times. Well, I actually don't refer to Stone Age times because the Bible says that we were created in the image of God. We weren't, we did not evolve from apes. <laughs> I think don't, don't degrade humanity by saying we evolved from an ape. We were made in the image of God. What an honour. So I don't believe that we were ever stone age, which was a bit of a bit dumb, you know, and happened to stumble on certain things. No, history shows another picture, and that another picture was what sort of intelligence did people have to make their pyramids? Uh, when they didn't have the technology that we have today. And you have a look at some of the th buildings. I've just been in Europe. Wow, oh, incredible buildings that are 500 years old and the incredible woodwork. And, you know, they say we're getting smarter. When you see things like that, sometimes you come to the conclusion, I think we're getting dumber. <laughs> so... Coming back to the high intensity interval training, you've just got to work out what works for you. But what I'm happy to Doug McGuff for is he takes you inside the cell and he shows why it has such an effective effect on heart. Because our heart is a muscle, so our heart is made up of all these little cells. So we looked at how the glucose goes in and it goes through a 20-step pathway. And this 20-step pathway gives us two units of energy. The end result of the 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. And pyruvate, as the chemical form of glucose, gets fed into the powerhouse of the cell. It's called the powerhouse of the cell because even though it's only an eight-step pathway, it delivers to us an impressive 36 units of energy. And what makes the difference is oxygen. Whereas this 20-step pathway, no oxygen. And then we looked at the high carbohydrate diet causing the little molecules of glucose to be built up. But what I didn't show you, and I'll show you now because this is one of the reasons it's such a powerful form of exercise. This 20-step pathway is a very fast pathway. Whereas the 8-step pathway is a lot slower. So when you're at the end of your high-intensity exercise, I mean at the end of the first session, your 20-step speed pathway speeds up, your 8-step pathway speeds up, and that's not a surprise because we're really moving, but there's a rate-setting enzyme in there that will always keep this one faster and this one slower. And so what's happening is more pyruvates being made than can be fed into the powerhouse. So what the body does is it stores it as lactic acid. You've heard of lactic acid? But what's incredible is that in recovery time, when you're relaxing, when you're just cycling slowly or walking down the hill, when you're in recovery time, the liver converts the lactic acid into pyruvate and feeds it into the powerhouse. So that recovery time means that the lactic acid is being mopped up every 30 seconds. It also means that in recovery time, our cells are running just as fast as when we're running for our life. And this explains one of the values for the heart of the high intensity exercise. You've, there's no report of anyone having a heart attack doing the interval training, but there are plenty of reports of people doing a 5K jog and killing over and dying. You've heard of it, we see them in the newspaper. And the couch potato says, see, I told you exercise was no good for you. <laughs> I'd like to suggest 
that on the 5k jog, that lactic acid is building up, 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 putting pressure on the cells, causing cells to swell. They're not that well hydrated. The, the salts are the wrong salts. And so it's again, it's a little bit of this, 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 and then the scales are tipped. The high intensity interval training, as these three doctors have discovered, is the most powerful way to strengthen the heart. And the heart is a muscle. And the more you use the muscle, the stronger it gets. So my son, Peter, he was training for a triathlon. He was running up and down the hills behind Brisbane. And he was getting stronger and fitter and fitter and up the hills for high intensity, down the hill is recovery time. He was going to do the running section in this triathlon. But he's a Tyler and about that time he was dismantling a vanity unit. It's an old 50s one, you know those big ceramic things. And it had a big chip in it. And as he was dismantling it, it slipped out of his hand, hit his ankle, and I think if he hadn't had a bone there, it would have taken his foot off. And the blood hit the roof. And he called out to my elder son, James. Apparently James is on the phone. James says, I'm on the phone, mate. And apparently Peter said, I need you quick. <laughs> I tell you this because it was a couple of minutes before James went in. And it was an old bathroom and James said there was this beautiful pattern of blood all over the roof <laughs> and the walls. And when and he bound it up and they went to hospital and the nurse kept taking his pulse, it was 50 beats per minute. Why was it 50 beats per minute? Because he's running up and down the hills. And that's why the blood hit the roof. If his pulse was 70 beats per minute, the blood wouldn't have hit the roof. The blood would have gone boop, boop. His heart was so strong that it didn't have to beat as much because every beat gave such a gush of blood, and we know it because it hit the roof, that it didn't have to beat as much. So his heart's like this, boom, boom, rest. Boom, boom, rest. What's the 70 beats per minute? Boom, boom, rest, boom, boom, rest, boom, boom, rest. How much rest is that heart getting compared to Peter's heart? Our exercise coordinator at Misty Mountain Health Retreat has been with us for about 20 years now. And the guests think he's 40 and he's 60, just turned 60. He's very fit. His resting heart rate's 46 beats per minute. Wow. Let's look at Howard. You know, he wakes up to wake our guests at 6. He's been waking up at 5.30 every morning for 20 years. And then he wakes the guests up. And they can hear him coming because he's riding his bicycle up the hill. <laughs> and then he goes on the exercise with them and he runs between the quick ones and the slow ones. <laughs> runs backwards and forwards to check on them both. And then he goes home after the morning exercise and does exercise with his wife. And then he comes and massages. That's quite a workout, massaging. And then he does the Pilates or core strengthening exercise with the guests. And then in the afternoon, he lights the steam sauna and he's chopping wood. <laughs> he's often got his shirt off when he's chopping wood. And the guests can see this incredible body. He's, he's, he's uh, part Dutch, part Indonesian, so he has a, a darker skin. In fact, one day he was cycling up his hill, which is like that, to his house. I said, why do you cycle up the hill? He said, my boys might be watching. <laughs> I think now he's got a 19-year-old boy and a 17-year-old boy. And they are also fit. Carsten, the 17-year-old boy, said, I've been doing 1,000 push-ups a day, 20 at a time, and oh, he is also very fit. So there's this competition in the, in the home, who, who wins the wrestling matches? <laughs> so father and son are keeping very fit. Michael and I were coming home from town one night, and it was dark, it was in the winter. And we're an hour from town, and the last half hour is on our country road. It's half tar, half dirt, and we're on the tar, and we see this light ahead. 
you know, going backwards and forwards like this. I said, what's that on the road? And we got closer and Mark said, oh, it's Howard. For fun, three nights a week, he goes on a 40K ride. <laughs> so I say to people, you want to look like Howard? <laughs> Got to be as fit as Howard. Maybe you don't need to do quite as much, but it's got a lot to do and with how Howard looks. And you know, Howard's always happy. He gets even the crankiest guests laughing. <laughs> and sometimes we get some cranky ones that are coming off caffeine and cigarettes and alcohol. <laughs> In other words, the way we treat our body certainly affects our mind, affects our mood. But Dr. Doug McGuff found that this was the most powerful way to strengthen heart function. Dr. Al Sears in his book, um, Pace, Progressive, Acceleration, You Are Moving, Cardiopulmonary Exertion. That's what the pace means. So you are exerting, you are accelerating, but this is progressive. What you can't do now, you will be able to do. So look at cardiopulmonary. The heart will get stronger, as I showed you with Peter's illustration. Cardiopulmonary, the Framingham Heart Study, done for so many years, you know what they found? That by the age of 50, most people had lost 40% lung capacity. Why is that? It's because they don't exercise. Because when you exercise, you start breathing deeply. They found that by the age of 80, many people had lost 60% lung capacity. It's time to move the body. I think I gave you a good illustration this morning, especially about women and the prolapses. We're going to start getting this body strong and fit. And we're training for something more important than the Olympic Games. We're training for life. I want to enjoy my latter years. And many people today do not. The body doesn't work well. But one of the funnest things I think in life is playing with your grandchildren, riding bikes with your grandchildren, climbing mountains with your grandchildren. And you've got more to give your grandchildren than anyone else, isn't that true? You've got the experience, you've got the, the knowledge. I think it's so sad that the people with the greatest knowledge and the greatest experience uh, aren't accessible because they're so sick. Their bodies and their minds are breaking down. Too young, too young. These, as you can see, are the true remedies. These will strengthen the heart. And before we finish, there's one herb that we have found has a powerful effect on heart function. And this herb can normalize heart arrhythmia, tachycardia. And this, heart, this herb can get blood pressure down if it's too high and it can get blood pressure up if it's too low. It's the hawthorn berry. It's an English berry. And you can buy it as dried berries. You can also buy it as a supplement. If you buy it as a dried berry, our suggestion is to have four glasses of the tea a day. And how you make the tea, because it's a dried berry, it needs a simmer. So to be two teaspoons, to one cup of water. So if you're making a quart, that would be eight teaspoons to, a, to four cups of water. And then it's simmer for 10 minutes. Or you can buy it as a supplement. And if you buy it as a supplement, you could easily take four to five thousand milligrams a day. I don't take that, but I don't have high blood pressure. But if someone's coming off their medication, initially they might take that much. But what we find is we don't find a huge change in blood pressure in a week or even two weeks. But as these sustain me principles are implemented, little by little by little, the blood pressure starts to come down. 
and especially if the person's carrying excess weight, little by little, as the weight loss happens, the blood pressure comes down, yes? Can they take that with their medications they... they can, yeah. Now the medications that can be stopped immediately are the statin and the blood thinners. That can be stopped immediately. What do you take instead of the statin drugs? There's no need to take anything because cholesterol is not the problem. Are there any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. You're saying you can cayenne pepper. I can't imagine taking it. Do you put it in capsules? You can? I'm just thinking that would be like eye opening. You can take it in a capsule form. Mm -hmm. You can take cayenne pepper in a capsule form. Or some people will put half a teaspoon in a little water and throw it down. It'll tingle, but it settles down. And ideally, you take it at meal times because it will give a nice boost to your hydrochloric acid. Take it at meal. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. just to be sure, someone that is taking 300 milligrams of the normal medicine uh, can change it, can stop it, and change it for the uh, for these. Yeah. Which one? is the medicine? Uh, the blood uh, thinners. Yeah. The blood Eliquis thinners. Eloquist is another one. Yeah, I don't remember thinner. exactly the name. Yeah. So if someone's on warfarin, that's a pretty strong dose, they might take two capsules three times a day, and then as the body settles down, they can start taking one capsule three times a day. Remember, you can't overdo cayenne pepper. And there's something called cool cayenne. It's a, in, you buy it in capsules. And one guy was taking large amounts, two capsules four times a day as a painkiller because his hand had got crushed in a machine. He said that that had brought more painkilling effect to him than Tylenol. Cayenne? Cayenne. It's an analgesic. It means it has a, pla a, a painkilling effect. And he found the cool cayenne, he could handle that better. Yeah? Cinnamon. Does cinnamon offer benefits for blood pressure? Uh, not as much. Not as much. You see, cayenne pepper is a blood stimulant, which means it stimulates movement of blood, whereas the cinnamon is more a nervous system one. Well, I consume cinnamon in a lot of things that I'm not sure I can consume the cayenne in, but I'll work on it. Berry was good for um, arrhythmias. What about um, heart failure? Yep. Yes. Yep. It strengthens okay. the heart. All right. And my other question is red yeast rice. Would that be something to take ah, instead of a statin? Ah, you could take red rice. Red rice isn't actually a rice. It is a nice grain, though. But uh, there are reports that it can help. It lowers cholesterol, apparently, like a statin, though. Well, the other thing is, do you want to lower your cholesterol? Right. Right, <laughs> so probably not. <laughs> I actually don't know what my cholesterol levels are. I've never had a test and I don't plan to. Yeah. Everything works. Uh, uh, yeah, I just wonder what do you feel about uh, natokinase? The natokinase is uh, fermented soybeans. The Japanese consume it in large quantities. And it is a blood thinner as well as a, uh, a vein dilator as well. And it's touted very highly as being uh, better than, uh, than a aspirin because it lasts a lot longer without the, uh, the, the side effects. And another thing, uh, aspirin comes from the, the willow bark, the salicylic acid. Uh, if you take straight salicylic acid, not the, uh, the added, you know, molecule of Bayer or Bayer, uh, uh, would that be better than, you know, for some people who can't take uh, capsation? I, I, I kind of love it myself, but uh, I realize why they... they yeah, can't yeah, take. and that's why the people that can't handle the cayenne, the capsule usually plays a role, and the cool cayenne... Apparently is even easier, but uh, aspirin does come from willow bark, and you can get willow bark tablets. So that is another option. 
Yes, uh, just really quick. Um, so to your point earlier where you're talking about the cayenne being used on someone who crushed their finger, I think. Um, I was actually somebody who crushed my finger in a wood splitter um, accident between a piece of wood and it was terrible. But um, the tip of my finger, it was, you know, where you would expect it to be. And um, I, my wife remembered about you talking about the cayenne pepper and how it can also cauterize um, uh, you know, bleeding. So as much as I was <laughs> afraid, um, I, I was bracing myself, but she went and got the cayenne pepper and sprinkled it on, and lo and behold, it did happen. And then shortly thereafter, uh, where my finger was not on my bone, it, uh, it actually, when we went to the hospital, it was back on and everything was, you know, it wasn't bleeding as much. And actually, be, you know, when you experience an injury like that, the cayenne didn't really hurt as much as I thought it would. Yeah. Um, but just really quick, I, I've heard people talk about using cayenne pepper um, for uh, migraines. And I've heard them, you know, they say drink it, but then I also said take it nasally as well if it's, you know, through your nostrils. If it's really, I've heard, I don't know if, I just wonder your thoughts on that. And then also people say, you know, if you, uh, you can use it in your eyes to help it become, you know, help. <laughs> it's crazy. So I, you hear extreme things like that. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, you'd have to be pretty brave to sniff it, but it wouldn't hurt you. And in the eye, it can certainly reduce uh, the pressure from glaucoma if you're brave. But it will not hurt, it will not hurt. That's true. Yes, we've seen many serious injuries, bleeding stopped with the cane pepper. Um, I'm, I'm, I did not know, know that this was an analgesic pain mm. clear, killer. So I have several patients that have had back surgeries um, and they're in excruciating pain because of nerve damage. So how would I be able to give this to them as an alternate painkiller versus, you know, codone and When you look at the Vicodin. cool, you can buy cool cayenne. So what's it called? It's called cool cayenne. I think it's got aloe with it, which makes it, you know, okay. gentler on the gut. But it can never hurt. Okay. So Should just high amounts. Topically or internally? Internally. Internally. Okay. The guy that crushed his finger, and by the way, they were going to amputate two of his fingers, and his wife contacted me. I said, no, 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 no need, cane pepper, cane pepper. And he kept his fingers. So he was taking it internally as a painkiller, and he was also putting it on externally to get blood to that area. In fact, the surgeon was shocked because he, the, the tips were going black, but he kept his fingers, yeah? Um, he touched on migraine headaches. Do you have any... Thing that you could take well, from Well, what migraines? one would look at is why they are there. And it can be allergy to certain foods. It could be the spine is out of alignment. You'd have to look at when they come and why they're there. And also, a lot of ladies get migraines at period time, indicating that can be a hormonal imbalance. But yes, the cayenne as an analgesic can bring relief to a migraine. I have a couple of questions. One, earlier on when you mentioned about the colonoscopy and how you would never do it, um, do you feel the same way about pap smears? Absolutely. N not necessary? Notice there was no hesitation in my answer. Every pap smear damages the cervix. Every time you have a pap smear, you are damaging your cervix. So uh, when they say pap smears prevent cervical cancer, they do not. They can even contribute to it. So the way to prevent cervical cancer is to um, keep the hormones balanced and implement the sustain me principles. Okay, um, two other questions. One is chlorine in pools. Do you swim in pools that have chlorine? Uh, I might the odd day, but I wouldn't swim in them every day. In fact, I, I saw one article about children who, uh, who learnt to swim as babies and the the negative effect that swimming in chlorine pools every day. But there are better ways, you know, you can have salt pools. They have a little bit of chlorine in the salt pools, but not much. Okay, and then creatine as a substitute. Would you ever take creatine? Or how do you feel about adding creatine? To oh, I don't advocate creatine. Um, I just like to get my 
um, nutrients from food. Okay, and then one last question, borax. Um, do you take, what do you think about the whole borax? Bath? Borax is from boron, and boron is a naturally occurring mineral, so it's a great cleaner in the house. What about taking a borax bath? Yeah, you could, yeah. And what about taking it in your water, or no? Uh, I would question why okay. you would take it in water. Okay, you. Thank might you. take it for a certain condition, I guess. Okay, thank you. Yesterday you spoke about an alternative to black pepper and it was some kind of seed. It was the seed from the papaya. Papaya, thank you. And you certainly get a lot of seeds in a popo or a papaya. Eliquis, it's a, for blood clots. Hmm. Is that something, it's like $900 a prescription. Yeah, it's so much cheaper to just do cayenne pepper. Okay, thank you. <laughs> And cayenne pepper has no nasty side effects. Could you just please repeat the dosage of the cayenne for analgesic use? Um, well, this guy who crushed his whole hand, he was taking two capsules four times a day. You might not need to take that many. I was working with a young 17-year-old girl who'd lost the tops of three of her toes in a motorbike accident and she was taking th two capsules three times a day and that reduced her pain. Hi, I was just wondering, you mentioned caffeine and I kind of like my two cups of organic coffee in the morning, is that bad? It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last question. Um, I, obviously you're probably familiar with CoQ10. Yeah. I was just wondering what you thought of ubiquinol. The did, did you know that when someone's on cholesterol or medication, that, that blocks the pathway that makes cholesterol, but it also blocks the pathway that makes coenzyme Q10. So everyone who's on cholesterol or medication is also low in coenzyme Q10, and that's our heart protective enzyme. But our liver naturally makes it. It only oh. stops when you're on cholesterol or medication. Okay, so you're saying I don't need no. ubiquinol? Okay. Is there any way to kind of measure how thin is too thin with the blood or how, you know, well, if, you, how are you going to get can, it just right, especially if substituting for medication? That's one of the challenges well, I've come across. Well, ideally, when... Ideally, with the medication, you stop and you start to drink more water. You might go and have a blood test in a month and just see what your blood thinning is. And what one girl says is, she said, I don't tell the doctor, or he just loses it. Now, the doctor has no right to do that because you are employing him, so that's good reason to sack him. But the fact is, what one lady said is, I just go and have the blood test, and he usually says, looks looking good, keep on the medication, and she just smiles and leaves. <laughs> because the fact is that, that a lot of people don't think they can t stop because of fear, because they've been told they'll have a heart attack. Well, you're not doing nothing. You're taking the cane pepper. And what about mammograms, your opinion on those? I have no hesitation in answering that. No. Absolutely not. Yes. Uh, a writer said this, having a mammogram is like lying down on a highway and letting your breast go on the highway and a semi-trailer runs over it. The mammograms are incredibly damaging to the breast. Not only is the breast like run over with a semi-trailer, squished, but then that, radio that radioactive through it also damages the cells. Doctor. Um, Lorraine Day, she was an um, orthopaedic surgeon in about the 80s who had breast cancer and she showed the statistics how many mammograms are contributing to breast cancer because of the damage done to the breasts. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, so, so many people are having blood clot issues, would cayenne pepper help with that also? There is no drug that will break up a clot. What the blood thinners do is thin the blood. Whereas cayenne pepper will thin the blood, open the capillaries, and help to break up the clot.
Um, in regard to the cayenne pepper, um, I've heard of different heating ratings. You know, what's, what do you recommend versus higher heating ratings versus what you can get at Aldi? Well, the higher the heat units, the less dose you have to take. And one lady was taking 40,000 units of uh, heat units of cayenne pepper in a capsule form three times a day, and that worked well. And someone gave her a 90,000 unit uh, capsule and she drank it down and it came straight back out. It was a bit strong. <laughs> so she decided to go back to her 40,000 units. Look, my um, issue of colon cancer was discovered when I had a colonoscopy, right? I'm hearing you saying that you won't have a colonoscopy. But I am due to have a checkup again soon because I am a survivor of colon cancer. So could you tell me what is the danger of the colonoscopy that you're well, talking about? One of the dangers is that the mix that you take before you have a colonoscopy is incredibly um, damaging because it's so caustic to get your bowels emptied. Now, I can't tell you what to do. If you have conquered your colon cancer and you really want to have a look, I, I understand that, but personally I would not have one. And then some would say, well how do you know there's something wrong? Your body will tell you. Your body will tell you if there's something wrong. So we should be having three bowel movements a day if we're eating three times a day, two bowel movements if we're having two times a day. If there's ever blood in the urine, if, if the if there is ever pain, you see, these are some of the things that might ind indicate that there is a problem. Thank you. Um, could you share some other examples of the high interval, high intensity interval training? Um, I do Pilates, but I know that's more low impact. Um, but any ideas for the hit? Yeah. Well, I guess. Anything that can get the heart rate up and increase, incre increase um, your, your uh, exhalation, your, your breathing. And I talked about Inspiration Hill last week where I didn't have to run at all because it was very steep. Um, the exercise bike, most of the research has been done on exercise bike. And I know in some gyms they do a Tabata protocol. Tabata was the Japanese physiologist at first. Well, it's not saying that he first did it, but that's probably the first documentation of the high intensity interval training. And he used to um, train his, his girls who were figure skating champions with the interval training. And he found with them it was 60. No, it was uh, 20 seconds high intensity and 60 second recovery. That's what he did with them for a cycle of six. But in many gyms today, there's the Tabata protocol. So there might be the rowing machine where you'll do some high intensity. There might be uh, a rebounder where you'll do some high intensity. There might be, um, I don't know, weights, other things. But there's a cycle of different things and sometimes it's just running on the spot. So. There are many different types of interval training and that's why I say to people, you do what works for you. As long as that heart rate up and that, that um, respiration, that's the word I was looking for, respiration increases. But the biggest challenge is in and out through the nose. You will, you will be challenged by that, but you'll get better at it. So it must be time for a break. And we are, we'll return again at six. Oh, here's a question, yeah? I recently learned that um, breastfeeding can reduce the risk of breast cancer. What can? Breastfeeding can, can. reduce uh, the risk yeah. of breast cancer. And um, I was also wondering, you know, what your thoughts are on that and also for um, babies you know, mo moms that didn't breastfeed, you know, the impact, you know, on the breast, and also for uh, women who have had abortions. As a health coach, you know, I encounter different things, so I just wanted to ask that question. Yeah, there's certainly, you see, breastfeeding a baby, that's what the breasts were made for, is for breastfeeding. And so it keeps, it keeps them active. 
absolutely. Um, so with abortion, that is certainly a contributing factor with breast cancer because when a woman falls pregnant, her, um, her breasts start to produce, you know, start to get ready to produce milk and then suddenly there's an abortion and so that, that is taken away. And Dr Lorraine Day, the orthopaedic surgeon that had the breast cancer in the 90s, she, she was pointing this out. She was looking at uh, regular abortions. Obviously that might be similar to a miscarriage and a, a miscarriage is something a woman doesn't choose, it's just something that happens. And one miscarriage or one abortion is not a huge contributing factor. Yes, breastfeeding does help. What if a woman cannot breastfeed? Not every woman that doesn't breastfeed gets breast cancer. And as you'll see, I'm sure from the lecture this morning, there are many threads that, that come together. But ideally, there are no abortions and ideally there are no miscarriages. Also interesting to note that when the hormones are balanced, the miscarriages are rare because it's progesterone that binds the molecule of the fetus to the lining of the uterus. So when a lady has multiple miscarriages, often the cause is a hormonal imbalance. So the main cause of breast cancer really is a hormonal imbalance. And as I showed you this morning, there can be many factors.